We'll go right into our almost final session of the afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Kate, and thank you so much, Cass, for this illuminating discussion that we've just had. We will now be joined by three deep thinkers on behavioral science who will push the boundaries of behavioral science and help us think a bit more about what's next. And at the very end of this afternoon, we will be able to celebrate some of the next generation of behavioral thinkers who have uh, won the awards this year at BX16. With that, let me introduce our next panelists. We have Eldar Shafir right here. Eldar is a psychologist joining us from Princeton University. Uh, as we, as uh, Kaz just mentioned, written this amazing book with Sandal on scarcity and really brought attention to how behavioral insights can affect but also help those with more disadvantages in society. Uh, next to Eldar, we have David Leipson. David um, didn't have to travel quite as far. Uh, he's uh, at the Harvard Econ Department. He currently, in fact, is the chair of the Harvard Economics Department. And David, how is that going? <laughs> um, and he's also the chair of the Human Behavior Initiative at Harvard University. And of course, has brought lots of insights to the field, um, but maybe most importantly, or early in his career on hyperbolic discounting. Then next to David, we have Rachel, Rachel Glenister, who's joining us from MIT, where she is the executive director of the Poverty Action Laboratory and has done very important work on health and education, on gender equality in particular in low-income countries. But I think for our community, one of j -PAL's, um, particular innovations, I think, is that J-PAL was one of the early institutions which tried really hard to translate research into action by providing, for example, an online searchable tool for all of us to find interventions where they have been tried out, what the researchers had found. And we've had some of those discussions over the last uh, one and three quarters of a day now as well that that might be a useful tool for us in behavioral science as well. And so we can learn a lot from uh, what you have done. Thank you very much for joining us now. And please join us on the stage. <laughs> Rachel, are you going to lead us off? OK, great. Thank um, you very much. So great, great to be here. Um, I love the introduction uh, to this session saying, and now back to academics, because I spent um, 15 years as a policymaker before moving into research, and I still absolutely refute the idea that I am an academic. Um, but I, ha I have two thoughts um, coming out of this, uh, this conference. One is about the future direction of research in this area, and the other is about the partnerships that have been developing between researchers and policymakers. Um, and I'm sure... Um, Elder will talk more about this because um, he's done a lot of work in this area. But I think uh, on the on the research side, what I've seen is very, you know a lot of the early work was about documenting the the mistakes that people make uh, and the the fact that certain mistakes come up again and again, uh, and also the effectiveness of things like nudges. And I think the the new wave of research um, is very much looking at the mechanisms by which people are making, that explain why we're making those mistakes, and also, in particular, why the poor uh, make, make mistakes in certain areas. And I think we, um, Jay Paul organized a session looking at uh, poverty and its effect on decision making and cognitive function. And I think the really exciting thing is to see these researchers working on some of the, the fundamental ways in which poverty uh, can, can affect your decision making. So things like noise and sleep um, and stress and risk. And if we can address some of those issues, can we improve um, decision making? And I think the exciting thing about that work is that it, 
it really addresses one of the issues that people have raised about behavioral insights, which is, oh, it's so, you know, so small, like you're only addressing these small things. Well, if you're addressing malnutrition and noise and seeing how those things feed into a negative cycle in which people then make poor decisions and then end up poorer and then have more stresses, um, I think, you know, you can see that this is a very fundamental um, important issue and could have really quite big impacts. So that's, that's what I want to say on the research side. On the collaborations with government, I, I've just watched over the last few years um, and seen this explosion of other organizations and you know, many organizations doing the, the kind of partnership model of bringing researchers and policymakers together and working together to generate research but also to take on board the lessons of research. Um, we, uh, in one of the sessions that I was in, we had uh, Nadine from MDRC, who's probably the organization that has been doing, running randomized trials with governments, you know, since the, uh, for the longest time, and you know, there's experience in the US since the 1980s of that. But I think we also heard about kind of new developments in that area <coughs> where, uh, you know, a really more collaborative, uh, where you're really trying to build the capacity of the government that you're working with, not just to evaluate, you're not just evaluating their project, but really help them build the capacity to do research themselves and understand research themselves. Um, and I think that's, that's exciting. And, and we see really a huge number of examples now of research units embedding in uh, in governments all over the world. So, you know, J-PAL South Asia has had this uh, intense partnership with the government of Tamil Nadu, which has, you know, 70 million people um, across many sectors, many trials. Um, and in the Ministry of Education in Peru, again, placing a research unit within the ministry that is really experimenting. And one of, I mean, we've, focused on behavioral insights here, but one of the things that I want to say is that many of, the, many of these units are behavioral insights teams, but many of them are, do more than behavioral. They are integrating behavioral insights with kind of standard economic advice, um, you know, the lessons from RCTs which are not necessarily behavioral, and I think that's again a way in which I see this developing. Um, you know, you might first introduce the idea of doing randomized trials by something non-threatening like changing a letter, but, you know, very soon you're on to working on kind of fundamental issues of government, and we shouldn't just restrict ourselves to, to lessons that are, that are behavioral. So, you know, some of the work we're doing um, are, is on improving education systems, and there are many important nudges you can do there. Um, you know, providing information in the appropriate way, again, you know, very behavioral informed. But some of the lessons that we're talking about are about making sure that the curriculum is at the level of the child and not, you know, aiming the curriculum up here and the disadvantaged kids are down here and they just can't learn. Well, you know, that's sort of, that's um, not necessarily behavioral, it's just, uh, in some sense, maybe it's common sense, but it's one of the lessons that has come out of of randomized trials really th across the world. So I think, um, I think I'll end there, but I think I want people to take away this idea that these, these partnerships with government take time to build, uh, but as you build them and you know, uh, put effort into building them, they, the payoffs should not be seen as just more research. They should be seen about as bringing the lessons from other research into, uh, into policies and incorporating both behavioral lessons, but also results from, uh, from good research, uh, you know, from wherever it comes from. Thanks. So I'm going to be a little controversial, and I want to take the theme of nudges and push it in one degree further. Um, I want to begin by defining paternalism as I see it, and then talk about consequences beyond nudges. So paternalism is influencing or controlling about externalities, but it's about influencing you for your benefit, not for my benefit. Now, I think thanks to Cass's work, thanks to the last 15 years of research, we are very much on board with the program of nudges. But that sort of soft paternalism begs the question of whether we're willing to go the next step to strong paternalism, something that Cass referenced. Let's think 
for a minute. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Great. So um, let's think for a minute about why we're all skeptical of strong paternalism before then turning the corner and asking how far down that path we want to go in light of all of the insights that have emerged from behavioral economics, the need for nudges in the first place. So obviously we're worried about who's rational and who's not. It's not clear the government is in a better position to make decisions relative to everyone else. And if the government is not in that position to make the right decisions for us, maybe to go beyond soft paternalism, well, who is in that position? You know, firms, what other organizations might we contemplate? Employers, um, agents within the government, different parts of the government, who's gonna take that role? Of course, we're worried very much about conflicts of interest whoever takes the position of either nudging us softly or nudging us with greater strength, what are their interests and are they actually reflective of our interests? There's obviously the question of a slippery slope. Once we open the door to, well, nudges and then go further to strong paternalism, well, where do we stop? And do we end up in a place that we're very uncomfortable um, operating in? Now, if we're going to start talking about strong paternalism, someone's got to begin thinking about how we're going to identify people's preferences. So what techniques, what methods, what science can we use <coughs> to infer other people's preferences if we're trying to make choices, presumably, that is in their best interest? And then finally, just to keep this list short, we only have 10 minutes each, are people going to resent strong paternalism? I mean, they're already on the edge of resenting some nudges, well, strong paternalism takes it one step further and actually constrains choice. What do we mean here? We mean not choice preserving nudges, we mean choice restricting, choice changing um, policies. And those are, of course, um, even more problematic in terms of this resentment factor. So let me kind of now introduce examples of strong paternalism that I'm gonna guess most people in this room would endorse. Um, so for a start, mandatory education. You're not going to find many people who will stand up against that. Now, you might say, well, that's about children. It's OK, so good. Let's go to adults. Uh, Social Security. Again, uh, you go around the world, and wherever you look, there is overwhelming support for Social Security, which is the strongest of possible nudges. Uh, it's not a nudge. It's requiring people to save throughout their working life and then passing that resource back to them, not as a lump sum, but as an annuity in retirement. Of course, defined benefit pension plans work the same way. Less and less so in the US. They're less popular here as decades go. Everywhere else in the developed world, you find them essentially among all employers. And certainly still in the US, they're a popular feature uh, if you work for the government. Even our defined contribution plans, these 401ks and IRAs, well, they're full of strong paternalism. There's a 10% penalty if you spend the money early. That's not a nudge. That's a tax. That's a penalty. Uh, in addition, when we design these plans for employers like Harvard, we don't give people unlimited choices of the investments they can make. Instead, Harvard assigns a fiduciary. In this case, it happens to be me and a few other people. And we don't give people 600 choices. We give them five choices. And we say, restrict your investments to these five funds, not the 10,000 funds that are available um, in the universe. Of course. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is left and right telling us what we can and can't take when it comes to medicine and food. They're not saying we're going to label it as exploratory or experimental. They're saying you may not offer this medicine, physician. I don't care if you think it's good. We're going to make it unavailable to your patients no matter what warning labels you put on it. And of course, there's cigarette taxes. Um, again, overwhelmingly supported by the American electorate, overwhelmingly supported the world over. Right now in New York City, you buy a packet of cigarettes, I think, for about 12 bucks, roughly. I haven't done that recently. Um, and uh, the cigarette taxes on that $12 purchase, I'm sorry, of the 12 bucks, $7 are cigarette taxes. This vastly exceeds any measured externality from cigarette taxes. We think the externality on cigarettes, maybe it's positive, maybe it's a negative, negative externality. By that I mean, um, it's conceivable that when I smoke, 
I generate a financial benefit to the rest of society because I'm going to live less long and cost you all less in Medicare payments and Social Security payments. All in, probably, I do generate some very minor negative externality on society when I smoke, but it's nowhere approaching $7 a pack. Why do we have that? We're trying to get people to stop smoking. It's a syntax. It's not about externalities. Uh, and we can go on and on about all the strong paternalistic policies that our society endorses. Now, of course, there are some that we don't endorse, uh, or at least that are controversial, sugar taxes. Um, right now, we're in the midst of a national conversation about whether we should or shouldn't tax sugar. In Philadelphia, they're um, flirting with a very aggressive tax on soda. Other municipalities have voted those taxes down. There have been soda bans. New York City's very famous. You can't buy a soda for 16 <coughs> plus ounces. Um, uh, was ultimately rejected by uh, both the citizenry of New York and the judiciary. Um, but um, while we can find plenty of examples of Trump paternalism we don't like, I've just reviewed many other examples that our society does like. Um, so let me offer up some criteria for successful paternalism of all stripes. And so I guess I want to expand the conversation beyond nudges and say there's a much broader conversation about what paternalistic policies we want to have in our society, which of course includes nudges as a special case. But I hope we recognize, particularly to the extent that many of you find yourselves in policy positions in the decades ahead, many already are in that position, many of you will be in that position in the decades ahead, where do we want to stop? How far, how far reaching should our paternalism be? So here are some criteria that I want to think about as a group. First, does the paternalism reproduce what citizens would eventually choose for themselves anyway? So if you imagine someone going through life and becoming more and more experienced, well, if they're eventually going to come to a conclusion and say, I like this particular outcome, we may be able to help them and accelerate that with our policies early on. Second criterion, uh, what would informed or educated citizens do? What if we brought people in, sat them down for a week, gave them every bit of information we had about cigarettes or nutrition or everything else, tried to make it maximally unbiased? Of course, that's really impossible, but we could try. Um, what would those individuals have to say about how we should design the options in society? What about the popularity of the paternalism if we set it up to a vote in the citizenry? If we ask people, how do you feel about this paternalistic policy? And we see there's overwhelming support, say, for Social Security. That certainly is a vote of confidence for the policy. What about experts and their views, particularly experts without a conflict of interest? How do retirement experts feel about compelling people to save for retirement? What about biases? If we think there are very clear, well-documented biases that are driving people's choices, does that authorize us to adopt paternalistic policies in some cases that help them overcome those biases? Like an addiction of for nicotine, for example, which is overcome by a tax that lets people, encourages people, enables people to quit smoking. Um, what about if we go out and measure people's well-being and find that restrictive policies, paternalistic policies, actually improve subjective well-being as measured in surveys or even direct um, neural measurement of well-being? Those would also, I think, help us to endorse paternalistic policies. And finally, what do altruistic third parties have to say? So, for example, um, in some countries, your family is allowed to ban you from the casino. We could argue that may be about externalities, but we could imagine more generally giving some voice to people who care about us and their ability to kind of authorize or endorse policies that would help us. Now, if all of this makes you uncomfortable, and I think it does, I mean, we're all very worried about paternalism <coughs> that goes beyond nudges. I want to make it clear that we've already crossed that Rubicon again and again and again with great comfort in our civilization. Social Security, cigarette taxes, these are not nudges. These are powerful choice um, controlling, choice influencing, choice reducing policies that are overwhelmingly popular in our society and that I think most social scientists and I know most voters endorse. So to that extent, I think the question should not be, are we willing to go beyond nudges? 
but the question should be, how far? Thank you. Okay. It's going to work? It worked. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to follow a bit on David's uh, topics with a slightly different perspective. Um, I think one thing that nudges did that nobody talks about is not just help individuals, but educate policymakers. I think any policymaker who is attentive enough to notice what's going on sees a nudge and says, I didn't understand people before. If the nation changes when you change a default, then my model of people in the streets of America or England or anywhere else was just wrong. And so I think that was a, an amazingly important story. But now I think we're being too too scared to take the implications, and it relates a bit to David's point. If policymakers don't understand people, and they have to have a different view of what people are like, what drives them, what motivates them, then nudging is no longer what's going to be enough. We have to change how, how we think about people, what, what to do with them. And I think that's where um, there's a lot that we can do as a group in, in the future years. Uh, talk about respecting people. So Cass has a beautiful piece on uh, manipulation, and, we, and I commented, and we have a bit of a disagreement. I'm still waiting to see what Cass really thinks when he can no longer embarrass the president in a few months, but until then. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I, get, when I buy Apple uh, Microsoft uh, Word and open it and have to agree to a 100-page document, that's disrespectful. Now, it doesn't make any difference to me and that goes back to the lovely exchange that Cass ended with. But a lot of people around the world who have to sign mortgage agreements that balloon on them and all other kind of stuff, to them it really matters, obviously. Now, I get a lot of those documents, and when I sign those documents, yeah, I know that if anything happens, you know, Cass will defend me and we'll be fine. But other people don't have it, and it changes their lives. And it, it, goes, it goes from the big to the very small. If you look at banking in America, I've been collecting a lot of little nuggets about this. It's fantastic. Um, checking accounts deposit money in your account five days a week and withdraw it seven. That's a really cute exotic fact for most people in this room who don't care. If you're balancing $11.20 and you give a check and you deposit a check and one goes out and doesn't come in, your entire week has changed. And then you have to take a payday loan and then your life has changed, etc. Some of this stuff is sort of beyond belief. So. If you have $90 in your account and you deposit four $20 checks, and you give four $20 checks and $100 check, the bank could pay for the four 20s and bounce one, but it chooses to first deposit 100 and bounce five. That's legal, that's the way they do it. Why do I think it's interesting? I think it's interesting because most bankers, so here, here comes a really important point. How do we divide policymakers' actions between malice and naivete? between being just genuinely mean and not really getting it. I don't know if it's 2080, 3070, but I'm gonna focus on the part that's naive, and I'm gonna assume that not everybody out there is just out there to hurt people. I think even bankers, even bankers, if they understood the impact of this check playing game on people's lives for real, they'd have second thoughts, not to mention the voters. Um, when you go to what we do today in terms of what is legit and what is not, what is respectful, what isn't, you have a contract that tells you the truth, you have a contract that generally misleads you. A lot of people think there's a big difference. Of course, if both of them are written in Catalan and I don't speak Catalan, it doesn't matter which one cheats me and which one doesn't. And this is an issue that we have not paid enough attention to. To what extent are people just not understanding what you give them, not able to decipher it the way you intend them to be deciphered, and then the lies, the truth, the misleading, sort of very secondary. The fact that subliminal advertising is actually illegal, we have the liberty to make it illegal, but other forms of advertising are legal, but we don't understand the impact they can have on people. That's just not having a good model of how people function. If you look at the FDA's recent research on the size of plates that are given to us in restaurants, literally, when you order a burger today, you get exactly three burgers that your grandmother used to get in the 1950s. That's disrespectful. Now, it's not a question of you know, nudging or not nudging, it's getting what matters and adjusting things accordingly. Like David says, we do this all the time. The question is, do we know where to look in ways that uh, really make a difference? Um, 
you know, you can have a hobby of looking around and seeing some of the laws and regulations that are kind of guiding the streets of America today. And it, what's remarkable about this is it's basically kind of a very Christian nation of well-intentioned people who are just devastating a third of the nation, but with, with vulgar and wild malice that's kind of hard to imagine. Uh, you can read uh, Matt Desmond's book on eviction. If you haven't, you definitely should read Matt uh, Desmond's book on eviction. You can read Kathy Eden's work on $2 a day. Um, many books you can read on many topics. You can certainly read works on crime. There is clearly a, a lack of understanding of what makes the less fortunate in America look bad. They look bad. They don't smell good. They make mistakes. They look irresponsible. And then the question is, do the policymakers decide to make them pay for it until they shape up and take responsibility for their actions? Or do they understand what's going on and try to help them a little bit look more respectable, which they would do in a second if anybody let them? And there's data on this. So that, to me, I think is really the, the next step in the behavioral part. We have made it very clear that policymakers don't get it. And now we have to do is say, now that you don't get it, try to get it. Try to understand what is it that motivates people to do what they do and how do we adjust our laws to basically allow them to thrive rather than punish them. That to me, I think, is a, a super uh, important story. Uh, Bill McKibben has an essay that I highly recommend to everybody if you haven't read it. It's called The Christian Paradox. So McKibben, this is years ago, but McKibben says, how is it that the US, so professedly Christian, uh, is so unchristian in its behavior. And you know, it gives you international aid and infant mortality, all the usual stuff. And his answer is a survey that was done where more, most Americans think that the phrase, uh, God helps those who help themselves, comes from the Bible. Now this is gorgeous, because this is Benjamin Franklin being as uber anti-biblical as he can possibly get. You know, it makes Jesus turn in his grave to hear this. But, this is what Americans think, and what McKibben says is this allows you to go to church on Sunday and then go and do abusive Monday and think you're doing the right thing. Now, it's a provocative essay, it's not a complete story, but I think it touches a lot on what's going on. I think there is something that people would have second thoughts about and rebel against if they understood what makes people fail better, but we don't get it. And policymakers in particular, many of them, I'm pretty sure, have very good intentions and just not getting it. They plan to educate the poor rather than help them thrive. Um, I'm on this uh, group that the Gates Foundation has going around the country trying to study poverty. And when you go to places, I'll give you one example. We spent a couple of days in St. Louis, and you meet a woman, a 20 year old, who was just in jail for endangering her children. Uh, what she did is she left her two kids at home, young kids at home, and ran to her job because she knew otherwise she'd be fired. And they found her and put her in jail briefly, but that's enough to not be able to get a job again and all the whole story. Four years ago at the Fed, I was in a poverty simulation exercise where you know you get assigned roles, you run around a gym, and you know, David is my brother, and we go around and we do all kinds of uh, exercises, and things happen. And then during the debriefing, they interviewed people, and one very distinguished banker, shaking, said. I never thought I'd leave my kids alone at home and go to get my check. And by kids, she meant, you know, the other bankers, Rachel, all the others were sitting there. And that, bank, that banker would not have put the woman I met in St. Louis in jail. That's my point. And it's that little empathy bridge that we're so bad at to, to decipher failure, understand bad behavior, where I think if we can make policymakers get it a little bit better, there will be an enormous, enormous victory. And by the way, it might change completely the calculus of where you do and don't have to nudge because policies will literally change. <coughs> How you nudge banking will change once banking rules change in ways that help those who have less manage their accounts. Which by the way, as you probably know, all of you have free checking accounts subsidized by those who are bouncing their checks, uh, et cetera. So um, last thing I'll tell you, which is kind of a, my little project and we'll see how far it goes. Turns out I have a friend collaborator, her name is Ai-Jen Pu. She's a community organizer, a remarkable woman. And when we were talking about this one day, she told me you should go look at GLAD during the LGBT story. And it's a fantastic story. 30 years ago, the LGBT community decided we have to change our, our stereotype, our image. 
they hired a few groups, but GLAD was the predominant one, who basically focused on popular culture, entertainment, journalism, TV. They were gonna introduce positive characters into TV, advert, and, uh, TV uh, programs and into movies and had Hollywood working with them. And it's unbelievable. I mean, it's more amazing than smoking. In 30 years, LGBT turned from an exotic, scary thing to completely fantastic citizens. Another question is, can we do LGBT for the poor? And Ijen and I are trying to actually get money from Gates to basically have a group that, you know, it turns out Hollywood is filled with people who grew up poor and get it. And, you know, Jay-Z grew up in the housing project that we visited in Brooklyn. And can we go and simply, if you think, try to think of one case where we have a dirty, not smelling good, defeated poor person being a hero in a TV series. You couldn't come up with one. And so if you do that, can you actually change the image in ways that would alter the empathy that we need between policymakers and seeing behavior that just fails if you have the, the wrong model? So that's my comments. Thank you so much. So we have time for a little bit of a discussion and maybe I'll start us out uh, with one question and then I open to the floor. Uh, I am gonna kind of build on where Eldar left us off, but I think it's actually a question for all of you before, because all of you have touched on it. I think in David's language might have been called welfare, but you, you know, you're raising this question of, so how do we understand what the poor need, what they want, and is it empathy, is it experience, is it being with them? But I think it does raise this broader question that um, both you, um, Rachel and David, also raised is, so what are we trying to achieve here? And you know, for us economists, of course, the challenge at this point <coughs> is that behavior no longer tells us anything about what people really want. And so now, what do we do now? So how do we, learn in your, your world, Eldar, or in your world, Rachel, about what the poor need, what they want, what would make them thrive, I mean, or what would they themselves, or you know, where do we get the information from? By asking them, by observing them, by inferring? So that's the welfare question. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and give you guys some time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you're right, an economist, I think, I think I'm on, yep, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, economists have thought a lot about the welfare question in a world where just because someone chooses something doesn't mean it's in their best interest. So when someone takes cocaine or heroin and their life is falling apart but they keep consuming the heroin, doesn't mean that that's welfare maximizing or utility maximizing. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we can turn to. I'm very much against gold standards, so I don't think there's any single measure like revealed preference that economists used to use that we can apply now, but I think we can do some of the following things. Um, we can ask them how well they're feeling, um, whether they're experiencing well-being or not. We can ask third parties about their well-being, so ask an observer, is this person's life thriving or is this person's life not thriving? Um, we can directly model the biases that we see in their behavior, and this would be, of course, apply to all people. Everything I'm going to say, by the way, is about low income and high income. Um, so we can directly measure biases in decision making, biases that lead people to make bad choices and incorporate that in our welfare analysis. Uh, we can help people become more and more knowledgeable, and through their greater knowledge, maybe learn something about their deeper preferences. Um, so rather than asking someone who's never bought a house, go and buy a house and let me see how you do it, you ask someone who knows all about home buying and you see how they do it and that becomes a better model for um, a kind of um, successful home purchase. Um, we can ask the experts about well-being, experts particularly in domains of particular decision making. Um, so I think we have this long list of criteria that we can use to infer whether people are well off or thriving or not. Um, I use well-being as a general stand-in for the welfare of the agents, the citizens we're trying to help. And I think we'll have to kind of combine all these into a generalized framework, recognizing that no single methodology or criterion trumps the others. So David's thought a lot about sort of the, um, you know, the, theor the difficult theoretical question of what does it mean um, 
you know, what does an improvement of welfare mean when you've got these biases? I think my expertise is more kind of on the practical level of if you're trying to solve a problem, what do you practically do to understand what the issues are? Um, I think one of the things that is just really important uh, when you're going into an area like this is, is spending a lot of time listening. So, you know, you were talking about going and uh, seeing and, you know, being in these communities and understanding what people's challenges are because it, there's very often this difference between, you know, what the discussion about what the problem is up here and then we actually go to communities and, and ask people questions. You know, they're very much often <coughs> focused on very different things. Um, but I, there's also, it's also important to ask questions in a, you know, well, because if you simply go and ask people, you know, what's wrong with your life or what do you want to see improved, you don't actually get very coherent answers because that's not something people think about every day. And they're not sitting and abstractly thinking, well, what, what improvement in my life would, you know, what intervention would would make my life better? And there are obviously other things that that are impacting them that they don't know about that's impacting them. Often, you know, chronic health problems, the poor are unaware that they have those. They've never experienced not being hungry, and therefore they don't know how life would be different. So, I, you know, it's important to go in knowing a little bit about what they may not know. <laughs> Um, as well as being open to listening and hearing things that you're not expecting to hear. Um, and that's, you know, that's a challenge and something you learn by doing this kind of work. Um, the, the other thing I would say is there's listening and there's data. And you've got to go backwards and forwards between the two because um, often people will talk about things. I mean, I'll give you an example. If you, if you ask girls in... Um, in Bangladesh, why girls, you know, why they don't go to school. Um, they've kind of absorbed this narrative, which is girls don't go to school because of early marriage um, and because of social pressure. If you ask them, yesterday did you go to school? No. Yesterday, why did you not go to school? You get a, the teacher wasn't there is actually the most common. And nobody will ever come up with that answer if you ask them in this sort of vague, general, what's wrong with girls in education. It's just not in the dialogue. It's not in the dialogue at the national level, and yet practically on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so often asking these questions in a, a sort of very practical way elicits answers that, that are very different from what you might be expecting. Uh, but very briefly, one thing that's confused me a lot, and I think it's part of the, who we are, because we're not so reasonable and rational, is the value of, of talking to Rachel's people. In other words, all of David's faculty would say, what are you schlepping to St. Louis? You can read an article about it. And it turns out that spending a, an hour with this person who's not quite saying where they're looking with their eyes and twitch tells you a lot of things you cannot get from anywhere else. And again, it's confusing because I don't want to claim it's the only way or the best way to do it, but there's something to it. And the other footnote to what you're saying, um, Iris, is just I think the philosophical question of what do people really want is in the rubric of the comfortable. Those who don't have enough, you know exactly what they want. I mean, Matt Desmond's people want a home, and Kathy Eden's people want more than $2 a day, and it's pretty, it, you don't have to get too sophisticated to know what else they need. It's pretty obvious. Well, but is, is it? I mean, I, yeah. I would have, let me, let, me, let, me, let me challenge that. So, I, this morning I was giving a talk about our saving system at a different conference, I apologize. Um, and we had a pretty lively debate about the trade-off between whether we give people liquidity now at age 40 to address all of the needs they have, you know, the struggles, putting food on the table, repairing the roof, if you've got a roof, you know, all of the daily demands versus allocating resources to the future in retirement. And I don't think that's a good example. I don't have the answer whether at the margin we should be, granted, if we could give more to both, all the better, but the resources have to come somewhere from somewhere. But to the extent that I'm asking about 
allocating a marginal dollar to the 40-year-old family today that is feeling a lot of financial distress, or to that 80-year-old family when we know they'll be consuming less on a per capita basis, but the kids at least won't be in the house, so it's a kind of different sort of stress. I do think it's a big open question how we want to do that. I, I totally don't disagree. What I meant is that family is trying to finish the month. That part we know. You're helping them in two different methods, and it's a totally fair question to know which one is better. But you know, their, their needs are very uh, much more simple than the kind of things that we come up to, which is you know, how many rooms in the house does it give me more happiness? It's, I, think, I think it's a different level of dilemmas. I, I think your question is a very good one, which is how to solve the same problem, which is you know, for me to be able to finish most of the months between 40 and 80, and how best to do that. But, but you don't ask me what it is I want. That's what I want. And this, I mean, I think there's another area where people don't necessarily know. I mean, again, I pulled development examples because that's the area I know. But um, you know, there's a study showing that if you provide deworming pills, people go to school more and they earn more. At, you know, they earn considerably more when they're when they're working. They don't know that their kids aren't going to school because they have parasitic worms. Like they just, that's not something that people know because every. Every kid has parasitic worms. So blood in the stool is just, that's a sign of being a kid because it's so prevalent. So there are, I, I think that's why I'm saying you've, you've got to do this balance of, but we can understand the kinds of things that they wouldn't know. Well, you know, I mean, don't misunderstand me. I think this, this is a very subtle set of issues, but what, I, what I'm thinking at least is that these people want schooling and a home. Pretty straightforward. Now, they might not be able to report it, they might not be able to appreciate it, and there are different ways of trying to provide that to them. But I think at some level, the, the question of what it is that would make their lives better is easier than, it com than when it comes to us where, yeah, anyway. Okay, on that note, um, we're opening the floor. Yes. Hey there, Elder, this is for you. I really appreciate the comments that you made, but then you mentioned Jay-Z, and um, I lived a half a block away from the new Barclays Stadium that was in many ways made possible by Jay-Z, and then ended up displacing a ton of the kind of people one would imagine he would have more compassion for and changing the neighborhood into a place that poor people can no longer inhabit. So I'm wondering, I love the idea of nudging as being an introduction for policymakers into the human process or, or thinking about the recipient of you know whatever their, their policies and structures are. But could you maybe say more about what would it mean to really make that happen and connect them and make that somehow a viable ongoing part of the process? You mean the image of the, po the, image of the poor part? The Jay-Z story? I, you went from Jay-Z to Nudging, so I'm not... Which the way I understood you saying is this is something that's, that, that it's an opportunity to get people who make these really, you know, harmful rules to rethink the way that they structure these rules, and then we can also use these sort of models of people's personal experience, like right. Jay-Z's so, experience, to bring it closer to home. But what I'm saying is that doesn't seem to have done it for Jay-Z. <laughs> so, well, Jay-Z, so of course, we... is not my subject anymore, but, uh, <laughs> so I, I don't know Jay-Z. I mean, the, the, the point here was just that if you, look at the, if you look at GLAAD, if one was able to replicate that, notice, by the way, what GLAAD did is they went to a Christian nation and tried to change the stereotype of a group as anathema to that as possible. Poverty, you're going and trying to change the image of a group that's completely in line with what we talk about every Sunday at church or Saturday at synagogue or at the mosque or anywhere else. So in some sense, the challenge should be in some sense easier. The difficulties too, LGBT, everybody in their family or in their friend group of friends had somebody. Poverty is a bit more exotic, but that's the agenda. Now, I, I threw JGC just as an example. In the LGBT, it was very useful at some point to have community leaders and fancy people and generals come out and, and athletes come out and say, I'm gay. I'm thinking something very, Amy Poehler turns out grew up very poor. Jay-Z grew up very poor. I don't care what he thinks now, all I'm saying is, Look at these people. Now you could say, oh, but this could rebound. What well, people can say is, look, they made it, why can't others? And my answer to that is that's where we are today exactly, so I have nothing to lose. That's the image today. Look, these guys made it, why can't everybody else? So now the question is, how do we explain to them, here is somebody who doesn't look to you so 
you know, pathetic and irresponsible and unplanning as you think the poor are, he was that way before. He hasn't changed, he's just moved to a new context. And the question, now of course, there's different ways of doing this. I'm not an expert in advertising. I would hire the advertisers. But my view is that for, given everything we know, the fact that all of America gets up and gives money when a little girl falls in a well, there should be a place to work if they understood the deep, difficult, unavailable resources to those who are failing. And that in some sense, you know, just EITC, which is the best program we have, is for the working poor. Tons of people cannot work. I think America considers them not playing the game correctly. That's just twisted. I mean, and I think that we could do things there. Good. I mean, one of the most striking uh, survey results that I've seen a few years back in one of Ed Glazer's book comparing Europeans and Americans' yes. perspective on poverty, you probably know that result, um, was quite striking that in Europe, people overwhelmingly think that poverty is due to bad luck. And in this country, it is due to not enough effort. And I mean, if yes. you could change that perception, I think that's a huge, you know, hugely important in informing lots of policies and lots of nudges as well. Thank you, Iris. I, I forgot to say, in fact, that the challenge here is not to change people, just to make them more European. That's all we need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a good nudge. <laughs> so, I, David. Again, I, I'm, I'm going to make it more complicated. Um, right now, we're having a policy debate. I mean, we're beginning a policy debate. Uh, there was a referendum in Switzerland um, just a couple days ago on a universal basic income. And the idea that actually is much loved on the extreme right and the extreme left is that rather than having an EITC where you essentially supercharge people's wages so they get the benefit if they work, but they don't get the benefit if they don't work, you say everyone gets um, a small kind of unconditional transfer, endowment, um, and that's how we develop an anti-poverty pro program, and that's how we address inequality. Um, now, it's very interesting because behavioral economics actually suggests that the EITC, coupled with some disability insurance, might be a better policy than a universal basic income. And here's the intuition. So job market paper this year from a fellow named Ben Lockwood, who's on his way to Wharton, really terrific scholar and a great paper. And he's thinking about a world where people have present bias and where if you can incent them to work, you actually make them better off rather than giving them a flat, kind of flat income and saying, you go ahead and do whatever you want. So here's we have a theoretical framework that tells us we're doing lower income families a bigger favor by giving them a work incentive rather than by giving them a universal basic income. Now, it turns out that classical economics, take away the behavioral stuff, just do Milton Friedman style economics. Classical Milton Friedman style economics says you shouldn't have an earned income tax credit in sending people to work. You should just give people a universal basic income. So it gets really complicated. Do we actually go with Milton Friedman's vision that says give every family $10,000 and leave it at that? Or do we take things like present bias and behavioral economics seriously that says, no, 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 we're better off with a policy that incents people to work and then a disability program for those who can't work? Um, and I think we don't know. And so I'm very excited by the policy debates we're going to have in the next 20 years as we use psychology and economics jointly to think about these big policy questions, I think it's early days in terms of knowing how we should help address the problem, the grave and really nightmarish problem of rising inequality. We don't yet have the answers. I, I, just to say, I, I know the world is complicated. This one didn't complicate my story because uh, EITC, I think, is a brilliant program. Do so you, you like EITC? Not love EITC. I love EITC. I just don't like that it stops at working people. Right. Uh, and I think that you know the idea of giving Trump and Bloomberg uh, basic income, I think, is just silly. Wait, wait, so, wait, wait, but but but, but, I mean, but so, the fact that it, it has to stop at work, uh, working uh, people because it is a, an income tax credit. I know. So called earned, in, you know, earned misery credit. Doesn't matter. You have a new program. 
that gives help to those who, don't, who cannot work. It, I mean, the, oh, yeah. the, the oh, basic wait. income is a different story completely. It's not about the non-working. It's about the millionaire, I mean. Okay, why don't we open the floor for another question? <laughs> <laughs> Now you're shy because this was really interesting, I know. <laughs> yes. So I have to say the left side is much stronger than the right side. I'm just observing, so you might want to think about that. Yeah? I'm bringing it back like 15 minutes, so I apologize. It lost, lost me somewhere in there. But um, you were talking about listening, and I think sort of field work might be an equivalent to what we're talking about as research, or some of us as researchers in here. And one of you said we need to educate policymakers. And I wouldn't say just policymakers, people, people that hold positions of power. So that means software engineers and law students and anyone else that could influence society and humanity by making choices. So how, what are strategies that you would talk about to bring poverty and uh, the topics that we've been discussing all day to law school, to MBAs, to people that will have power. Or we don't. <laughs> I, I can only <laughs> but say we've that. been talking about listening to people and their problems, and we are researchers, and we generate this evidence, and is it falling on deaf ears? Are we, is this where it stops? So, so, so your question is, um, are we creating experiences for people? Sorry, Max, you do you want to comment? Yeah, I've, I've just been notched. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, no, no, happily, happily. So, well, you know, I don't know, the Kennedy School really qualifies. I mean, the Kennedy School attracts people who want to make the world a better place. And uh, so we have been overwhelmed by the interest of our students in behavioral insights. And they are very much, I mean, but you know, I don't actually know that's the people you think about. But certainly some of them become prime ministers and you know, people in power. But they are super interested in um, field experiences. They're interested in behavioral science. They're interested in making a difference. So I, I do think there is broad interest for what behavioral science has to offer. Um, you know, is it prevalent across all our graduate schools here at Harvard or elsewhere, you know, probably less so. I mean, there's quite a bit of selection going on in terms of <coughs> which school people select. Yes. I just want to come in on this um, because I think it's not, uh, you know, I do a lot of uh, spending time listening to people before I start um, on work and it's, it's challenging when you're working with policymakers, they can't spend as much time in the field and, and talking to people maybe as, as we can as researchers. Indeed, as I said, my first half of my life was as a policymaker and the second half um, as a researcher. And it was extraordinary how I spent so much time, more time in the field. You know, people talk about academics as being an ivory tower, and yet when I moved to research, I spent so much more time, you know, in villages listening to people. Um, uh, so it's just hard as a policymaker. You've got, you know, 15 things to do before lunch, and you know it's very hard to find the time to get out and do that listening. I think one way that um, that uh, bringing policymakers in to understand this process, I can I can think of two things that work very well. Um, one is if you do get involved in doing a study with a policymaking group, you just see people opening up to. Um, what the data can tell them and the idea that you can do things differently um, and that there, you know, there are different options and you can learn and improve on what you're doing. And you've seen, uh, you know, I've seen this myself with the policymakers we work with that just, you know, after you've done one trial on one small thing, they're just much more willing to open up and try many more different things. The other thing that's amazing is just, you know, simple data. It's just extra, you know, often people are talking about what they assume the issue is, what the problem is, and, oh, you know, poor people aren't doing this because of X. Like, we all know that there, there's open defecation, um, you know, because people don't have toilets. Well, if uh, we had an example earlier today of, well, if you just present them with the information that, you know, um, half of the people who uh, are, are involved in open defecation actually have toilets, but they're not using them. That just, you know, you sort of present them with 
with a different way of seeing the world and you start the conversation about, okay, what else might it be? What else might be going on? And I just, I also want to come back to what I was talking about before, which uh, I think is really important, this work on, on showing that poverty itself causes um, these decision making. Because if you, you know, if people do, um, if people do consider the poor as, you know, lazy and smelly and whatever, then if you can show that that same person with 700 more calories a day is suddenly making much more, um, you know, rational decisions or much, you know, the kinds of decisions we think they ought to be making, then that starts to change mindsets. Well, you know, if, if the, to observe that those people change with this small improvement in calories, it makes them understand that it's not that that person is lazy, it's because they didn't have 700 calories and maybe that's, that's why they're in the position. So I think that's, that's why I'm so excited about this work because I think it can fundamentally change our view of why the poor are poor. But I, um, I think your question kind of raises a bigger question for all of us and that is how can we communicate, and I mean communicate in a very broad sense, more effectively f to people who can't actually have the experiences that the panel just shared with us. It goes back to Elder's point also, means how can we educate the policymakers? And again, I don't mind educate in the traditional sense. I mean, what are the kinds of mechanisms? Again, think about nudges. And we've had some examples um, here also presented. So Will Doby, for example, presented his work on intergroup contact theory, exploiting the fact um, that now an increasing number of, of um, graduates go um, into Teach for America. And then what he was trying to understand is, does that affect their perspectives on life, on the race, on poverty, gender diversity, LGBT, just really contact. So kind of trying to understand what contact does. And yes, it does. And so the, you know, the question, I think that's kind of your question. So how can we create that kind of environment? And then Rachel, I think you earlier in the panel mentioned the work on soap operas. You know, sometimes um, revelations come from surprising sources. So exposure to soap operas and working women, professional women, has, for example, decreased domestic violence in, um, in, in India, Rob Jensen's and um, Emily Oster's work show. So I think there, um, there are creative ways for us to create experiences that might not actually require people to be in the field that would actually benefit from you know, behavioral science insights. So I think that's a broader appeal to all of us to think about that. I think it was Elder on There are groups, apropos that, that, you know, provide simulations that Kennedy School and Wilson School should hire. They do, you know, certain refugee simulation, they do poverty simulation, and it's, you leave it pretty shaken. No matter what you read before, the data you saw, it, it shakes you up and it leaves a memory. I've participated in one in Davos. Uh, yes, last question. Somewhat related, is there any movement or effort to uh, engage like the ad agency world in this work? Uh, it's a world as a former advertiser that represents great depth in knowing how to do qualitative research, ethnographic research, positioning messages to resonate with audiences. Um, and they have certainly have not been doing it to help people make better choices for themselves necessarily. Uh, I'm sure they would love to. Is there any opportunity or movement in engaging them in more behavioral insights work? It, it's part of our, I mean, I, I, I'm talking as if I have something in hand. The part of the agenda of this glad for the poor will be exactly that. And, uh, there must be some organizations who are doing some. Barbara Ehrenreich has a beautiful organization for journalism and poverty. It's a great website. You can see a lot of photo journalism and journalism about if you were to read a lot, that could educate you a lot about U.S. poverty, uh, but that's one part. You're suggesting much bigger, yeah. I mean, I, I do often think that a lot of, when I'm describing some of the behavioral <laughs> insights, you know, I just say, well, think about what advertisers do to get you hooked on things. And, and we more take those and then try and use them for, say, public health messages. And, it's quite extraordinary how bad many public health messages are and how you would, you know, if you were trying to sell any other product that was bad for you, you would not be doing this. So, you know, just simply repeating this is good for you, this is good for you is, 
it, it's surprising how um, how often that happens. And um, so, so I think definitely there is, if you think about the things that are being tested in behavioral insights, I think a lot of them came from advertisers in the first place. One, one twist on your question, the advertising agencies aren't that well tuned in to A-B testing. It's not a natural for them. So that's why we tend to import their ideas and then implement them in a field experiment <laughs> and do A-B testing. But there's a lot of other marketing organizations. Think about um, everything in Silicon Valley. Every product that is coming out of Silicon Valley is A-B tested. And I think that community is very interested in exactly this kind of behavioral science approach and willing to do control and treatment at enormous scale. So another way to take your question and twist it is think about finding partners who already are willing to go down that control and treatment path. That please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you very much. Traditions, um, by traditions I mean we, we did this last year as well. <laughs> One of the traditions that, that we've continued from BX uh, 2015, and that, that's a Junior Scholars Award. And this is really a process um, coordinated by the Behavioral Insights team, um, led by uh, Michael Sanders, who's a terrific partner on the Behavioral Insights Group. Um, and um, as part of the program, we announced the, the, the Junior Scholars Award um, over 50 applicants um, submitted their, their, their excellent work. Um, the, three fine, uh, the, uh, the three winners um, uh, were available, their work was available during our lunch today as a poster session. And I just want to uh, announce those winners. Uh, uh, just a couple more notes on process. Uh, the Behavioral Insights team uh, reviewed the 50 plus applicants, narrowing the poll down to 10. And then David Halpern and I um, anonymously reviewed the, the final pen um, and converged on the winners. And so first I'd like to bring up uh, Chuck Howard, a PhD student in marketing at the University of British Columbia for his paper, Understanding the Expense Prediction Bias. Place winner is Devin Tomke, Tomke, a PhD fellow in economics at the University of Cologne for his paper on decreasing non-payment for water in rural Namib Namibia. All three were extremely positively reviewed across the entire process. Um, uh, David Halpern and I um, independently selected um, Stephen Dallas, a PhD student in marketing at, at NYU, for his paper, Calorie Counts on the Left Side of Menus Lead to Lower Calorie, um, to lower calorie Foods, Food Choices. <laughs> So, so the three of them, that's a long-term future. The medium-term future is BX 2017. Um, and uh, to hear a little bit more, I'd like to ask Jang Ping from Singapore to come up and give us a, a quick overview of what to anticipate um, for BX 2017. Thank you, Max. Uh, I'm just going to take two minutes to, to just uh, give a quick introduction. Um, I represent the Singapore uh, Civil Service College, so we have always organized behavioral stuff for a couple of years already, but we're glad to partner BIT, um, uh, Australia, and all these uh, people to organize this, uh, the next versions of uh, Singapore uh, BX 2017. 
I've attended BX since uh, three years ago, and each one has gotten better. I promise you, next year will be better than this one. Yeah. <laughs> And we, oh yeah, and I just want to give us some brief introduction, right? And we have been nudging a lot. And David Lipson says that uh, Singapore is a, is a dream paradise for nudges. And that's because we strong arm our citizens, right? At, at times when nudging fails, right? So when David Lipson mentioned the fact that they are in Singapore, uh, a family member can actually apply to ban a person from going to a casino, and that is Singapore, right? It happens, right? Yeah, to pre prevent uh, uh, your loved one from going to a casino, you can do that, all right? And we, have we, we get hawkers to display their signs to make sure that they, uh, uh, Michael, 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 Michael cities, right? To display the signs, hygiene signs, and to warn people if, you, if, if, the, if the store is not hygienic, don't go, vi don't go visit it, right? We, we find people for littering in a, in a bringing food into the subways and stuff like that, but not durian. There's no fine for bringing durian there. Yeah. And we have been advocating this for a couple of years now. So these are just some of the tasters of the things we do. We will link up with academia, so join us next year. Uh, it's going to be around June to July. We haven't fixed the date yet, but we will soon. Look out, look out at our website and contact. We are calling out for practitioners and academ academics to share presentations, research with us. Please email me at jptia at mof.gov.sg and or Sharon Tam at the Civil Service College. Sharon, Sharon is over there. And finally, if nothing sways you to come to Singapore, remember we're just two hours away from Bali. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jane. So uh, we can see the medium-term future. And when you get back, or uh, when you get back after, after uh, BX 2017, you can follow that up with a visit. Um, I don't know where it's going to be, uh, Sim, but on September 9, sept 19th. New York City. New York City will be the next meeting of the uh, BSPA, the Behavioral Science and Policy Association. Um, and, and Unless you told us not to give away your contact information, we will be providing both organizations with your contact information, so they should be badgering you on a regular basis. Um, okay, um, so I have just a little bit of work left. Um, um, and there's a bunch of people who have no independence in how they dress. And I'm talking about all those green shirt people um, who are in the back. and uh, and. Um, uh, Primarily uh, students, but not exclusively, but people who have really done a phenomenal job um, to help get you where you're supposed to be and uh, in many ways improve the quality of this, of this um, program. I don't take any responsibility at all, but I think it's been a spectacularly, spectacularly well-run event. Um, so I want to thank all of those green shirt people um, for all they've done. So, so thank you. I, the, this program has been flawless because of you, and it, you've just been great. I um, want to highlight two other people. Um, Annie, you can move up a little bit. Annie Hard and Chabelle O'Flaherty, who have been working for months um, on, on the final details of this program. They've been um, a part of the, the team to put all the details together and make so many things uh, right before you ever got here. Um, Chevelle and, and Annie, thank you so much for all you've done. Appreciate it. And now I'd like to talk about myself for a bit. Um, so um, I've been um, uh, a professor, I'm finishing my 37th year as a professor. Um, three years ago, um, as Iris mentioned in some event, um, sort of Mike Norton and Francesca Gino decided that Iris and I should co-chair this, this organization. Um, so I want to tell you about um, my amazing decision. Um, the amazing decision uh, that occurred soon after Iris and I agreed to do this um, was um, I, I, I identified Abby Dalton um, to be our um, employee. Um, and Abby joined us and um, quickly became um, sort of famous on the Harvard campus 
um, extraordinarily popular um, among our faculty who just uh, quickly saw how amazing um, she is in so many ways. Um, then soon after, uh, the, our sort of extended um, family of Ideas 42 and BID um, got to know Abby, and, and she's just become kind of a central person um, throughout our community in a shockingly large number of ways. Um, it, it, so if you're wondering about who made all these peculiar decisions about the structure of the event that you've just been part of, um, and the, the, who directed it, who produced it, the answer is Abby, and I think, um, like everything else she, she does, she's just a, done a tremendous job in leading this event, and I'd like to ask you to come up. And join. As we do know that the wisdom of the crowd speaks louder than any words that Max or I could share now, we actually collected the wisdom of the crowd in here. Um, so these are some words from many people here in the room for you and for your team um, with our appreciation and a little thank you gift. Thank you very much, Abby. Thank you.